Good evening, everybody. Thanks so much for joining me on this call. It's going to be awesome. We're going to go over pelvic positioning and gymnastics and why it matters. So this presentation is called Pelvis Power, Optimizing Pelvic Positioning for Gymnasts. Keep in mind that I'm recording the call, so if you'd prefer not to be on camera, just keep your camera blacked out and you'll be all good. If you're open to being on camera, then great, you can leave yourself on. I'm actually going to go ahead and change my uh, settings here for just a second to speaker. We're at speaker right now. So mainly you'll be able to see me so that I'm demonstrating and speaking and all of that. And my name is Gina Paulus. I am a pregnancy and postpartum corrective exercise specialist. I utilize this information for moms, but I also use it for lots of other people who have similar structural issues in their body. It actually turns out that athletic people tend to have the similar type of posture that pregnant women and postpartum women have. So that ends up kind of going along with each other and making it that our um, exercises that we'll need to help with this are very similar. So for today's lecture, I did want to give you guys a little bit of an overview. Obviously our pelvis is at the center of our body. And as a gymnast, our body is really instrumental to our sport. When our pelvis is not in optimal alignment, the muscles in our torso, our arms and our legs are a lot less effective. This makes sense, right? Yeah, it's pretty uh, self-explanatory. So our pelvic positioning also happens to play a role in healing our diastasis. And if you do have a diastasis and you're more interested in that side of things, I've done four other calls that have done a deep dive into there. But just to give you that information about pelvis and diastasis, they really do go hand in hand. And when our pelvic positioning isn't ideal, it does make it a lot harder for our diastasis to heal. I'll give you a quick example of that. If my pelvis likes to sit in that type of position, which we call anterior tilt, what that's doing is it's putting a lot of pressure out of my belly. And so that's something where we can sometimes do all of our diastasis exercises, but our pelvis is screwing things up and it's not allowing us to heal in the way that we would want. So it's just, you know, another way we can work on it by working on our pelvis. So our pelvis can be in what we call normal orientation, which is actually a slight anterior tilt. I'll go ahead and show you on my pelvis model here. So if you look at this as being perfectly up and down, it's actually normal to be a little bit forward. And if we're even more forward than that, it's known as anterior tilt. And then this way is gonna be a posterior tilt. Just give me one second. I wanna turn on one more of my lights here. There we go. Um, so if we are a gymnast, we're more likely to be in that anterior tilt or that slight more tipped forward. And then you also have to keep in mind that our body can have the position that it likes to rest in, but also it has to do with how our body is moving. So to give you another example, if I'm here and I'm pretty neutral, but then when I go to grab my leg and do a quad stretch, I tilt that way, then I'm going to be going into anterior tilt. So sometimes people rest in one position and then when they're doing stuff, they tend to gravitate towards another position. So it's not quite as straightforward as you might think. And so gymnasts are not as likely to be in a posterior pelvic tilt. Um, the higher demand we place on our body as athletes, the more likely we are to go anterior because when we're anterior, it actually tends to make us faster. The problem with this though, is that we can develop issues such as hip flexor pulls, groin pulls, adductor strains, back pain. So obviously being a great athlete is the goal but you can't be a great athlete if you're hurt. So we want to keep all of this within reason and not let our body go too far out of normal in order to make sure we're optimizing both our health as well as our sports performance. Um, the other thing you can keep in mind about your tilt is that when you're an anterior tilt, what happens is our hamstrings shut off. We're telling those muscles to take a break. So here's my pelvis. And if you're in that anterior tilt, what that's doing is it's putting these hamstring muscles on a slack. That makes you really, really good at doing an amazing pike stretch, but not so good at having a lot of power. And this is one of the reasons why gymnasts who tend to be better at ball and tumbling, not that this is always applying, but in general, I think we can all acknowledge that the more powerful a gymnast might be on those leg events, they might tend to struggle a little bit more on the flexibility components on getting their 180 leap. Of course, they can work on these things and get better at them, but the tendencies are all there and we've all seen that. So shutting off our hamstrings 
you know, is needed for some aspects of our sport, but we want to make sure they're strong enough to also power those powerful leg events like our vault and our floor. The other reason that hamstrings can be turned off a bit in gymnastics is because gymnasts tend to be quad dominant. We're using these big quad muscles to do our jumping, some of our sprinting, our sticking, certainly squeezing our legs to keep them tight. And muscles like to work in opposition. So if I've got a muscle here and then the front is kind of going against the back, what we can find is that if one is too strong, the muscle on the other side tends to have trouble keeping up. The human body is designed for the back of our legs, for the glute and the hamstring to be stronger than the muscle in the front, the quad. For gymnasts, a lot of times that ends up being switched and you're in a position that is known as quad dominance where the quads have been known to take over. And when we're in that state, again, we're leaving a lot of muscular power on the table. Your glutes are your biggest muscle in your body. If your quads are trying to take over for your glutes, you're going to lose out on a lot of the power that you could have. Also, uh, going along with the quad dominance, we have to keep in mind how our abs are functioning. Now, a lot of gymnasts have really amazing six-pack muscles. You might be able to see them. You can certainly feel them if you press your belly. But the six-pack is only one component of our ab strength. We also have, so the six-pack muscle is called the rectus abdominis muscle. We also have our oblique muscles, external obliques, internal obliques coming the other way. We have our TAs, which wrap around four. So that's four major groups. Now we want all those groups to be able to pull their own weight and pull their fair share of the effort. If our six pack muscles are doing all of the work, then that's making us more front dominant. And just like with the quads, we're going to lose out on some of the maximal power and stability that we could have. And even more than that, we actually open ourselves up for back injuries and for hip and groin issues. A lot of gymnasts suffer from torn labrums in their hips. A lot of gymnasts suffer from chronic hamstring strains, unstable SI joints. These are all things that can be helped by working the abs in a really balanced way. And the cool thing is, if you work your abs in a super balanced way, you're going to get that better pelvic positioning automatically. So by working on our abs, we can help any diastasis we might have, we can help prevent back pain, and we can also work on our pelvic positioning to really improve our power. So if you ask me, it's a pretty sweet deal. We also can keep in mind how we're moving through things. So I'm gonna give you a little easy example with just walking. I can walk by pulling myself forward with the front of my legs and my shins. So I'll show you that one more time. It looks kind of like I'm ahead of myself with my feet, okay? Now, if I push myself forward, I'm a little bit pitched forward, and it's almost like my feet are pushing me. And I'm dramatizing this just a little bit so that you can see. But what we want to be doing to have the most power, and again, because pushing ourselves forward is using this and this, pulling ourselves forward is using this. And our body is designed to be pushing more so than pulling for most of our movements. And again, gymnastics, it kind of flips us all around and trains us to use our little muscles that really shouldn't be doing as much in our daily life, certainly, but also in our sport. It can train those muscles to do more than their fair share. And that's one of the reasons why gymnasts tend to have so many injuries. And injuries are just horrible. They ruin our day. They can ruin our month or our year. Nobody wants to deal with it. It's the number one reason why gymnasts quit. And of course, we don't want that. We want to be able to do our sport for as long as we would like to. So there are a few things that we can test out together to find out whether or not we're in an anterior pelvic tilt, a neutral pelvic tilt, or a posterior pelvic tilt. The first thing that we're going to work on is an exercise called an adductor drop test. Okay, so I'm going to show you how that one goes. You can follow along with me. So we're going to lie on our side to start. It's nice to have something to prop your head up so that your body stays neutral. And this is pretty close to neutral for me where my head is in line with my spine. It's a little high, but it'll work. So I'm going to start by pressing my hip into the ground so that I can slip a hand under my waist. This is what I call a mini side plank. You're gonna hold that. You can see my legs are bent 90 degrees. You're gonna lift your knee as high as you can without letting anything in your back or your pelvis change. Then you're gonna move your knee back. You're gonna see how far back you can go. Go ahead and look down. Is your knee straight out from underneath your torso in line or does it stop in the front? 
mine stops in the front. Well, let's assume that you can get all the way back there and you can do it without letting your waistband change or tilt, okay? Without letting your knee drop and without arching the back. So if you can do all that, and keep that waistband nice and steady, straight up and down, you would then try to drop your leg and see how far you can drop that leg, again, without anything moving in your pelvis or your back. All right, so make note of that. Now let's try the other side. It is pretty common for people to have a fairly significant difference from one side to the other. All right, so we're lying on our side, passing into the floor to form that mini side plank. Now we're gonna lift our knee, we're gonna go back, look down. So for me, this one's almost straight. And if you don't make it to all the way back, you actually shouldn't drop because there's really no point. At that point, the task is complete if you can't get yourself all the way back in line with your torso, but just for demonstration purposes, I am gonna drop mine. And once again, we're really focusing on the band staying even. We don't wanna see that kind of move that way. All right, so to make note if you could get back in the first place, if you could do that, how low could you drop? Did you make it about halfway to the floor? Did you make it all the way to the floor? So for a neutral pelvis, you would be able to get, generally, these tests aren't perfect, but generally you would be able to get about halfway down to the floor. If you're in an anterior tilt, you probably can't get your knee back. And if you're in a posterior tilt, then getting your knee back would happen for you. Um, dropping the leg would also happen and you would likely be able to drop your leg further than if you had neutral pelvis. So that is one of the things we could take away from this test. Most gymnasts are going to fall in the anterior tilt bank. And so that's generally what I see, but not always. So, um, next we're going to talk about standing and seeing a few things there. So what we need to do with standing is the summit of our iliac crest. And we have to find that on our body. So the iliac crest is going to be that bony ridge on the front of your pelvis. And we want to try to feel for the highest point of that where it's located. And you can pick one side to test and you can find that highest point. So for me, it's right around here. So I'm going to place my finger there. And then I'm going to place my other hand right on the front of my pubic bone. And then we're going to compare. Is my pubic bone in front of my summit of my crest? Or is it behind my summit? Where is my pubic bone in relation to that? When you're doing this, you want to make sure that your knees are soft. You're not hyperextending your knees for this. Okay. And so for the APT or the anterior pelvic tilt, then the iliac crest will be in front of the pubic bone. For the posterior tilt, it's the opposite. You would have the summit behind the pubic bone. All right, so that's that test. Now we're gonna try one lying down. Okay, so for this, you'll be right on your back. Okay, I'll show you this. And we're gonna go once again to those landmarks. You can straighten your legs. One hand on the pubic bone, the other hand on the iliac crest, and we're trying to figure out is our pelvis or our pubic bone, I'm sorry, pubic bone in front or higher than our iliac crest or vice versa. So pubic bone higher is gonna signal more of a PPT or a posterior pelvic tilt. Pubic bone lower is gonna signal more of the APT or the anterior pelvic tilt. Now you might be the type of person who has a different result for these three different tests. And that's what makes a job like mine kind of interesting because most of us are in a perfect case. It's more of like more of this, a little bit less of that. So very few of us are 100% one way or the other. If you're getting two tests out of the three, then I would go with that. Um, there's, It's kind of complicated to explain, but there are some people who are in an anterior pelvic tilt, but they've actually masked it with something that we call glute gripping. And with that, what we're doing is we're taking our butt muscles, and a lot of this we can't even necessarily feel we're doing it, but we're squeezing kind of deep in there, and that's taking someone that would have been like this, and it's kind of tucking them under like that. And again, it's really common for people that have this to not even know that they're doing it. And you can't really necessarily just tell yourself to stop. There's certain exercises and stretches that we can do to help with that. That's a little bit more of a complex one. And so it's beyond the scope of this to really dive into that. Um, for this particular call, we're going to focus more on the APT. The PPT There's actually one more that's called the high hinge point that we're going to talk about. 
And I will go over that right now with you. So the high hinge point typically goes more with the PPT people, um, which is why I haven't brought it up until now. But high hinge point, I'm actually a great example. I have one. Um, this is my top of my pelvis right here. And you would expect the curve of my lower back to be right around there. But if you look at my back, it looks like it's a little bit higher. It's not, not by a lot, I mean, by an inch or two, but it's a higher hinge point than is normal. And again, a lot of gymnasts do have this. So again, it's not to say there's something wrong with you or you know your world is going to end. It's normal and common. It's just that if you have had pain and trouble with generating power, chronic issues, if you've had any of that stuff, like this is a really powerful way to help with that. So just knowing about it and knowing what we can do to help can be really, really powerful. And so uh, standing is a great spot to assess. You can also lie on your back and you can feel for where your back pops off the floor. So I'm going to give everybody a chance to try that right now. Go ahead and lie on your back. And once you're there, you can take your hand and feel. Does it feel like right behind your top of your hips is where you feel the biggest arch? That would be considered a normal place to have that. A high hinge point is going to be a little bit higher up. I can't necessarily always go by waistbands because I know people wear different height waistbands. Um, but thinking maybe of like the top of your underwear can be a little bit of a more uniform area to describe. So where like a bikini top would be, that's the area that our lower back normally would be arched. So you can feel that and see if you're also a high hinge point type person. Um, so I am going to give you guys some quick tips with what you can do. So say if you were an APT, grab a ball if you have one handy. And I like to use what I call the pinky ball. This one actually has letters on it for a whole nother thing. Um, too much for today to talk about the letters. But this is a pinky ball. You can use a tennis ball. You can use a lacrosse ball. You're going to roll what we call the paraspinal muscles, which are the muscles that run up and down your back. So you're going to place the ball against the wall, and you're literally going to massage those muscles. Just leaning into it and bend your legs move it around and see what area might feel like it needs more of a release. That's a great thing to do if you have APT because those tight muscles in your spine are going to pull on that pelvis and really feed into that pattern. So if you have a posterior pelvic tilt, rolling out your glutes and your pelvic floor is actually the best thing you can do. So glutes, you'd place the ball right around your side of your butt. So we don't want to go over the middle, but the fleshy part, you're going to do both each side. And then for pelvic floor, I do have some videos on my YouTube channel, which is at Gina Paulus, um, or you can search whole bodies fitness on YouTube and that should come right up. But on um, the pelvic floor release, I'll give you guys just a quick, quick rundown of that. So you're, you're kind of just sitting on the ball, you're going around the bony area on the bottom of your pelvis, and you're gonna work kind of the inner thigh area, and none of this should cause pain. It might be a little bit uncomfortable, but you don't want any sharp pains. And you're just kind of hanging out on the ball. You can move it further back near your tailbone. Some people like to do it with their legs out straight on the floor. That's perfectly fine as well. Usually, if you're more sensitive, the chair is a better place to start with that. So for any of these releases, you want to spend a minute to two on each area. Don't go crazy because if you overdo it, your muscles could rebound and talk back to you. And that obviously won't feel good. Um, high hinge point. So for that, you want to focus the ball on more the area that dents in. So like right around here. You can certainly do the other areas as well, but those are going to be the most powerful areas for you to work. Our psoas muscle in our hip also attaches to that spot. So as muscle runs up in front like that. And so working that back is really awesome for the high hinge point. All right, so regardless of whether you have an APT, a PPT, or a high hinge point, there's a great exercise that actually helps all of these things, which is really cool. So I'm going to show you that. And there might be slightly different areas of focus you can do, depending on which type of pelvic positioning you have. So I'm going to get that set up right now. You will want to have two pillows handy. If you don't have them for today, then no big deal, but ideally you're going to grab those when you go to do this again. And so the bolstering is what we call the pillows. And you'll see here that I've got my two pillows right here. You want to set up near a wall. 
and you'll have it staggered so that the one pillow will be under your shoulders and the second pillow will be under your head so that there's two pillows under your head. We also want to have a balloon and something to squeeze between your knees. A foam roller works really well. A yoga block is great. If it's yoga block, most people do best with the medium setting, so that width there. And you're going to go ahead and lie on your back right now. Have your block ready. You will be in a 90 degree angle with your legs bent, so make sure you sit close enough to the wall that you're able to be in that 90 degrees, just like I am here. The block goes between my thighs. My feet are going to be wider than my hips. I'm going to take the balloon and I'm going to inflate it. So before I do that, I'll tell you guys what we want to try to think about while we're doing this. We want the breath to go into the side ribs as well as the back ribs as fast as we can when we inhale and we're inhaling through our nose. We're exhaling obviously through our mouth to fill the balloon up. As we're doing that, we can draw our pelvic floor up slightly and we can also squeeze our block and drag our feet down. So I'll show you a couple reps of how it looks and then I'll cue you. So here we go, I'll do three for you. And then you get to watch the arrow and you can giggle at it if you want. It's funny. Okay, so I am going to cue a full round of this so that you guys can work on it with some more cueing. And so go ahead and get set up. Okay. And we're going to have our feet on the wall. You can go ahead and take a nice big inhale breath. Okay, as you exhale, you'll try not to bite the balloon or squeeze it closed with your lips. Try to keep open with the lips. Exhale as long as you can. Once you're done with your exhale, hold your exhale. Breathe in again to your back and sides. Filling your lungs as best as you can, keeping the air in the balloon. Exhale, squeeze your legs together, drag your legs down the wall a bit. Don't actually have your feet move. Pelvic floor up, hold. Relax everything, relax your legs, relax your pelvic floor as you breathe in again. And exhale into your balloon, squeezing the block. Good. Hold. Let's do two more. Inhale into your back and sides. Try not to let your shoulders shrug up by your ears as you inhale. And exhale all the air out. Really filling that balloon, holding. And inhale again. And exhale, squeezing. Lightly dragging your feet down the wall without actually having to move. Pelvic floor up. And hold. Awesome. Okay, so a few more specialized tips for people with specific pelvic positionings. If you're in an anterior pelvic tilt, you might need even higher bolstering. You might want two big pillows or maybe even three pillows. So you're gonna wanna err on the side of more because the more rounded your back can be, the more easily your abs will be engaged and your back muscles will be stretched and you're gonna be able to reorient that pelvis faster. If you're in a posterior pelvic tilt, you might be tempted to squeeze your butt to help make this movement happen. We do want to keep our butt nice and relaxed while we're doing it. So keep tabs on that if you're in a posterior pelvic tilt. If you are in a high hinge point, you're going to be the same as the anterior pelvic tilt, where the higher bolstering will really help you. If you're in posterior pelvic tilt, you might not even need a bolstering. Most people still prefer it and feel better with it, but it's less important for you. So you also want to build this up over time. You want to blow up a balloon that might be a little bit on the firmer side. If you use the same balloon over and over and over, then get a new one because it gets stretched out like anything else and it's not going to give you as much resistance. You can also blow the balloon up more. So say you did six today, six breaths, you could do eight or 10 as you get stronger. You also can sequence the sets where you do one round of blowing the balloon up, let the air out and right away do a second set and then let the air out and then right away do a third set. 
that's going to give you more resistance training in a shorter period of time, which will build your muscles faster. Whereas if you do the balloon blow and then you rest a minute and then do it again, obviously that's easier. So those are ways to advance it. Um, cause definitely want to increase your, you know, challenge, just like any other strength movement, you want to make sure it gets more progressively challenging so that your body doesn't just stall out with its progress. Okay. And so that's a really great exercise that you can work on in terms of just kind of hitting everything. It works as a really great warm up. I always did that before gymnastics practice to just get my system kind of set up and ready to go. Um, all right, so then we're gonna do another exercise that will be fun to try together. We're going to see if we're able to move every single part of our spine without missing even one section. So a lot of you guys might be familiar with the cat-cow positioning from yoga. It's a great exercise and stretch and it's cool and everything like that. But one of the problems with it is it doesn't necessarily call out our personal areas that might be tighter or get stuck on us. And if you think about the spine as a sequential amount of the vertebra and we're leaving some vertebra out, well, then we're not going to be able to evenly round our back, evenly arch our back and really maximize what each and every vertebra can do for us. Sometimes our body is stuck there because of an injury or because of our genetics. It might be harder to improve in those cases, but even still, I find when people can work on this, it definitely will help. And a lot of times it becomes a habit. So for example, say if 10 years ago, you hurt your back. And then ever since then, you've moved your back a little bit differently. Your back isn't really injured anymore, but you never updated what we call our map in our brain of how our back can move. It's usually subconscious. It's not like we're purposely trying to do this, but it's really common. So let's go ahead and give this a try. And we'll get in our hands and knees together. Okay. So we want the hands right underneath the chest and the knees right underneath the hips. Shoulders down, so see how I was here and I just dropped them down. What we wanna do, elbows are soft, pointy part of our elbows pointing straight back. I'm gonna give you guys a better view of my core. So if I just kind of start with this, this is where I'm going to naturally be, a little bit archy on the lower back. So I'm going to try to establish neutral. By pulling up that way, I'm trying to flatten my mid back a bit and bring up my lower back. So that's just working on neutral, can we get there? Now we're gonna relax that. And what we're gonna do is do pelvis up, head up, and we're going to work on sequentially going into the opposite. So I'm gonna dip my chin, then I'm gonna round my shoulders a little bit, try my best not to let my lower back change while I do it, mid back. Now I'm gonna let my lower back try to do that without the hips, this one's really hard for me. Then I'm going to go ahead and allow my lower back to move even more. Now my hips will participate as well. And now I'm fully rounded as best as I can today. Now we're going to do the opposite. So looking up with just our head, letting our shoulders arch back a bit, letting our sternum sink through, mid back sinks through, lower back comes down, pelvis up. Okay, so now I'm fully extended. Now we're gonna try the same thing from the tailbone area. I'm gonna tuck my sacrum, my lower pelvis. Okay, now my upper pelvis, my lower back, my mid back, my shoulders and chest, lastly, my head. Now we're gonna do the opposite of going up. So tailbone up, try not to let anything else change. Okay, lower back sinks. Mid back arches, sternum comes through, shoulders back, head up. All right, so that was called segmental cat cow. If you find there's areas on you that are really kind of sticky, which for me, like I said, is my lower back, I could spend some time just working my lower back and just seeing if I can come out of it and then go back into it. You can also slow it down even more and literally try to move only one vertebra at a time. That's pretty tricky, but the control is really going to help. And if you have certain skills that you work on in gymnastics where you need to do specialized shapes with your core, this is going to be awesome for you because it's going to give you that great control that our skills really do require. Um, 
All right, so then we are going to work on another one that is a little bit more in the strengthening and stretching of our back department. And that one is called hands and knees breathing. So we will be once again in the hands and knees position for this. Now, a lot of gymnasts will think this is kind of silly because it's it looks like a plank that's just super easy. But I promise you, this is going to work your core in a way that's a little bit different for you. So um, this one, we are going to take in mind our pelvic position. If we're an anterior tilt, we might benefit more from squeezing something between our knees. I'll show you guys afterwards on my pelvis model why that's the case. If you're in a posterior tilt, you want to spend a lot of time keeping those glutes relaxed, just like we did on the wall exercise with the 9090. If you're in a high hinge point, you want to spend a lot of time working on moving the part of your back that resists that movement. So if I'm here and trying to show you my high hinge point where there's a little dip kind of mid back, I will want to make sure I'm really working that up so that I'm able to flatten that without clenching my whole upper back as well. So it's kind of like a tug of war between, you know, not letting the upper back do more work, but also bringing that high hinge point up. So those are all things you can keep in mind as you're working on this. I'm going to do the squeeze to show you that. So here's my item to squeeze. A yoga block works fine as well. Okay, so we're here. And actually, once again, I'll show you my core so that you can see what's going on. So first, we can establish that neutral, okay, as best as we can. You'll see I'm looking at myself in the camera, which I still need to do after all these years, so you probably will need to do it as well. A mirror, a recording, anything you can do to see yourself, a reflection in a screen, whatever it is, find something to look at because it really matters a lot. Our body doesn't know what we're doing other than whether or not it feels normal to us. So if this is our normal, we're going to feel like that's straight. And I'm sure you've all seen that in your skills when you've recorded them. You're like, oh my gosh, I had no idea that my legs look like that. So I'm sure you guys understand what I'm saying. All right. So this exercise, we're going to take a big breath into our back and our sides. Trying to make these ribs move. And if this doesn't make any sense to you, check out my first and second diastasis call on my website. Um, I'll give you guys the links at the end. Exhale, tighten your abs, engage. Then feel your rib cage moving together. Hold your abs like that as you breathe in again. Breathing into your back and sides. And exhale. Keeping your abs engaged. Breathe into your back and sides again. Make sure you slow that long neck. Exhale. And I'll show you guys a bad one. This is me letting my abs go. Okay, we don't want that because then we're not maintaining that tension in the front and we're not breathing into our back and sides at all. Let's do one more together. All right. So as you advance that one, what you wanna do is challenge yourself. Can you make your exhale longer? Can you make your exhale 30 seconds? Can you hold your exhale for 10 seconds each time? You're gonna be pretty tired after that. It's usually not realistic to do that right away, but that's something that we wanna work up to. And once all of that is easy, let's go ahead and add a balloon. You'll blow up a balloon in that position, just like you did with the 1990. And once you get good at that, you can challenge yourself with doing planks, traditional planks on your knees or on your feet with that nice back expansion breathing. Of course, when we're doing gymnastics, there's gonna be time when we hold our breath. But for strength training purposes, it's really, really good to challenge ourselves to move our ribs while we're holding the position. Because if you hold the position and you keep your ribs squeezed and tight and you're not breathing into your back at all, it's less work for you because there's no stability challenge. It's kind of like the difference between balancing on a BOSU ball compared to balancing on the floor. Obviously the BOSU ball is harder. So just like that, it's harder for you to breathe like this while you're holding your ab strength in your positions. Um, all right, so then there's also posture tips that we can talk about. You can do exercises until you're blue in the face, but if your posture is not good all day long, you're going to have a lot of trouble with this type of work sticking for you. So it's really helpful to make sure we know what the posture tips are. Uh, before we do that, though, I did want to explain about the squeezing. So here's our pelvis. And if we're in an anterior tilt, that tends to go along with our pelvic inlet, which are these top guys here. And I'm going to dramatize it, but they're going to be more flared out which of course you'll see makes the bottom or the uh, outlet go in. So this is normal. This is generally more an anterior pelvic tilt. And when that's like that, for us to normalize this and make this come in a bit, 
if we squeeze these guys together, that's actually going to bring this in for us. And so that's why squeezing something between our knees tends to help if we're in anterior pelvic tilt. But like I said already, if you're in posterior pelvic tilt, your big thing is going to be to not squeeze your butt. Yes, you should squeeze your butt when you do a lot of stuff, but not when you do these core things. So that will be a better tip for you with that. And if you're in high hinge point, you can also squeeze something. Um, okay, so the pelvic tilt posture. And so one thing that really anybody can do when they're thinking about posture is imagine that they're lifting up through their pubic bone. What that's going to do is really support your abs and your spine better than drawing your abs in. So if I'm here... And I'll try to show you guys, like if I just try to like pull my belly in and I'll be honest, I'm not really amazing at this, um, but like pull it in like that. I'm kind of like forming a little bit of a dent there. And there's people that can do it way, way better than I can, but it's actually not good to do it. So I'm kind of glad I can't really do it that well. Um, but anyway, so that's what that would be like drawing and like sucking in, pull your belly in. And a lot of times I think when you hear a coach say that, like pull your belly in, that's what we just want to do because it's the simplest way to do it. But let's try something else. Let's try, I'm going to let my abs go a little bit so you can kind of see like, this is me doing nothing. This is me just like hanging out. Um, if I draw, think of drawing up through my pubic bone, watch what happens. I'm not really purposely sucking anything in, but, and look at what happens to my spine when I do that. See how it starts to fly. So if you're the type of person that has a big archy back ham, uh, handstand, well, something like this can really help. And of course, if you're upside down, it's the opposite. You're drawing pubic bone up to your head, which is now upside down, but same idea. So just drawing that up is a great thing. And you'll see it kind of like tucks my butt a little bit, but I'm not actually squeezing my butt. So a lot of people, when the, the coach is like, squeeze your butt, they're going to just clench like they're trying to squeeze a pencil between the cheeks. That's a way to get it done but it tends to compress our tailbone and our sacrum, which is the bones down here. And that tends to cause sciatica, irritated SI joints, tension in our butt, stiffness where we have, you know, trouble doing our splits, things like that. So it's better to do that draw up through the pubic bone and up through the crown of head to get that alignment naturally without actually having to squeeze anything. And it will also use a lot less muscles that we would want to stay fresh. So drawing up uses less muscles than squeezing your butt, which will eventually get really tired. And if you have a whole routine to do, like a floor routine or a beam routine, your butt's going to get tired pretty quick. So we don't necessarily want to exhaust it by just squeezing it and hoping that that will, you know, do the trick. Um... So this postural habit I just taught to you, I've seen this literally heal people's diastasis recti with that one thing. Like if all day long, they're just lightly sitting, uh, pulling that up. And if you're sitting, you could do it in the chair. You can do it while you're standing. You can do it while you're working out. And all that time, your alignment's just like, whoop, and it's just really, really straight. And then we're no longer pushing our pressure out because you can think of it like this. Do you have a diastasis because of the pressure you're pushing out forward or the other way around? Did the pressure you put out forward cause diastasis? It could be either or, it's chicken or egg. So if you think of it like a bathtub, there's one way to, uh, you know, fill the tub, which would be to turn the water on. And then the other thing we can do is plug it so that we're accumulating the water. So we don't just want to plug it. We don't just want to turn the water on. We want to do both. And so working diastasis and exercise is awesome. But then if we're not reinforcing it with our other 23 or 22 hours of the day that we're doing other things, well, then we're leaving a lot of results on the table that we could have. Um, so dr that drawing up is actually going to naturally and organically give you support from your TAs. Their muscles, like I said before, they wrap around they don't actually cross the midline either. So the interesting thing about TAs is if you have a diastasis or a hernia for that matter, which is what I had to deal with, um, one of the cool things is TA muscles aren't as affected by this because they, they're not supposed to touch. It's the rectus muscle in the front that touches. And so working the muscles that aren't separated too far is actually really, really powerful because those muscles are going to be in a healthier state to work for you. So just that stance alone can really work those muscles. Now, you don't want to be like, Ooh, you know, here I am, like totally, like rigidly free, you know, squeezing everything. It, that's just not going to last you a whole day. So it's like a 10%. So if this is me kind of just doing nothing, and then I'm going to pull up like 10%, it's, it's almost too small to see, 
but that's what you want to do when you're just living your day, because obviously you can't like squeeze everything for your whole day. That won't work. You can do it for skills more because skills aren't going to take that many hours. Um, but we want to gauge this with our activity. If you're standing in a line, 10% should be fine. If you're doing like a double layout, you want to do 100%. So just kind of keeping that in mind is helpful. Um, so... The TA muscles, like I said, are great for helping all the postures. They help APT, PPT, high hinge point. So if you're a little confused as to what you are, if you work those TAs, you're going to really benefit a lot. So you can go onto my YouTube channel and you can search homebodies, genopolis, any of that should work. And you can find any exercise that is helping the transverse abdominis or the TAs. If you type that into the search bar, you'll find a bunch of things you can do to help yourself with those. So I think that would be a great way to do it. Um, also hamstrings. Our hamstrings control our pelvis. So here's me with my pelvis and then my hamstrings. And my hamstrings are not as strong, especially up higher here near my butt, then my pelvis is going to want to tend to do that. Um, sometimes as well, if the hamstrings here aren't strong, our glutes want to take over, they clench, they tuck us that way. And we look, you know, like we're in line more, but we're getting there with this and not with this. And so proximal hamstring is another great thing to work on. Again, you can do the 90-90 exercise. That's a great way to start working on it. You can search my YouTube channel, proximal hamstring, and you should see that. Um, there's also my call four. This is call five, but my call four in my main area of, um, you know, the links to all the other calls, you can get some, a whole, you know, video on just the proximal hamstring, but that's another really good thing to focus on. And proximal hamstrings are great for helping with our power, our sprinting speed, our vaults and our pummeling and our jumps and all of that stuff. They also help prevent back injury and uh, hamstring pulls in many cases. So that'll be a great use of your time. Um, now there's other things we can do besides the pubic bone with the crown of the head thing. Um, we can do lining up our pubic bone and our sternum. So here's another great tip for basically talking about how we're standing. So even if you have an initial pelvis, but you like to stand, oh, let me get my feet in too. Um, you like to stand kind of drifted forward like that. Oops. So like you could actually balance there, but you can see how if my fingers on the side of my side of my hip, the part that would stick out if I stuck my hip up to the side like this, okay, if my fingers there, ideally we would want that stacked over my ankle. Okay, and right now it's over my midfoot, almost over my toes. You'd be shocked how many regular people and how many gymnasts stand like this. And it almost starts looking normal because so many people do it. It's not healthy for us when you stand like that. You're putting a lot of pressure on the front of your hip socket. You're tending to tighten down your glutes and make them stiff and unflexible. You're putting pressure on the labrum of the hip. You're irritating your knee joints. There's a lot of bad stuff going on with this. You're also putting pressure on your feet that really isn't ideal. So you can pull those hips back so that they're lined up over your ankles. Just doing this alone should make your abs kick in just a little bit to help keep you upright. Your back is going to arch if you lean forward usually. And what happens when our back arches is our belly just goes to sleep and the abs are doing nothing. So if you pull yourself back, you can think of your hips going back. You can think of somebody gently poking your ribs back. You should feel a light engagement in your abs. Again, it's not your max. It's just 10%, just enough to keep you standing there. Then once that's in place, we can check everything else. Are our shoulders over our hips? Is our ear over our shoulders? Now, if you have forward head posture, like I have somewhat, you can't just necessarily like fix it by just wanting to do it. But that is something that you can work on with time with certain exercises too. That's going to be beyond the scope of this call, but you just want to basically optimize how much you can stack to the best of your ability. Like if you have forward head, you're not going to just make that go away with intention, but you can usually bring your hips back with intention. You can bring your shoulders back somewhat or, you know, with the intention as well. Um, and then once we're there, we can focus in on our sternum and our pubic bone. So we're going to place one hand in the sternum and one on the pubic bone. And if you feel like your sternum is in front of your pubic bone, pull that puppy back. You should feel a gentle lift in the front of your pelvic floor with this. And you can spend about a minute feeling this and trying to get that balance. And then just kind of let it go. But it's a great thing to check in with it during your day. So maybe it's every time you have a meal right before you eat, you'll do this and kind of just see. 
And then you'll notice that over time, you will start doing it just as part of a habit that you've formed. Um, and then you'll get to the point where you won't need the hands anymore. I know it looks a little silly to be like touching all over, but while you're in the privacy of a space that is private for you, like, yes, do that. And then you'll get to the point where you can just kind of feel it without having to touch. And then you can do it wherever you are. And it will be nice to like have that habit in place. It's also really, really good alignment for skills. So when you're doing a gymnastics skill, when you're doing choreography, like check in with that. Is my sternum over my pubic bone? Like, how is that going? for any time that you're in a somewhat neutral position. Um, so we talked about the TAs, how they form a corset muscle around our abs, which is a really powerful way to keep ourselves healthy as well as keep ourselves strong, keep our pelvis in a great position. And we talked about our standing posture. Now the sternum with the pubic bone tip, that one is really, really, really good for high hinge point. That's my favorite one for that. For the anterior uh, tilt, I like the pubic bone with the crown of head. That's one of my favorites. And for the uh, posterior pelvic tilt, a lot of times it comes down to just relaxing our butt. And again, this is something that is kind of happening inside, but I'll try my best to show you. If I'm clenching my butt, it's going to pull everything kind of together and it might start tucking me under a little bit. And oftentimes you'll see, sorry, this is a little graphic, but like with loose pants, you'll see like a crack like it will kind of go between the butt cheeks and they'll basically tend to get wedgies. Like obviously in gymnastics, you get them anyway, but if someone has like, you know, pajamas on or something like that and the, like their cloth is right in there, that's indicating there's probably some clenching going on. And we want to make sure we can bring awareness to that because while we're doing that, we're not going to get out of that pelvic tilt. We just can't because the muscles are overriding the position of the bones in that case. Um, okay, cool. So then we are going to try one more move together. It's called a side plank. This is another one where there are some great special tips for whatever type of pelvis we've determined that you have. So I am going to show you this one on a chair. You can most certainly do it on the floor as well if you're really strong, but I do want to show the example of the chair because I find a lot of people, quite frankly, just suck at side planks and they're not really getting out of it what they should because it's too hard for them and they're not able to make their muscles work the way that we want. So um, for this, we're going to try going our elbow. And I'm on my right elbow, so I'll have my right leg down. My left leg is over my right. I'm thinking of dragging my heel backwards, which is going to slightly tuck my pelvis under. I'm having my hand on my waist. Aim your belly button ever so slightly towards the ground and look towards the ground. Now that we're here, we're going to send a breath into our back and sides. And we're gonna breathe out, engage our abs. Keeping our abs engaged, we'll breathe into back and side again. Don't let your belly go, breathe out. Abs engaged, breathe into your back and side. Breathe out abs. Try your best to form a straight line from your armpit all the way down to your foot. Make sure your ankle is not resting on the ground, but rather it's lifted away from the ground. Try two more breaths together on your own. Good. And again, breathing into your back and sides. Exhale, abs. Dragging back with that foot. Good. And switch sides. And if you'd like to try on the floor, if you were on the chair, vice versa, feel free. I generally find that I want to be on a surface that really allows me to get that deep breath. And if it's higher on the chair, then great. And you'll probably find that over time, you're able to make it more difficult and you'll still be able to get that nice big breath. But this isn't the time to kind of show off and do it on the floor just because you think that it's better. You want to make sure you're doing it at the level that you're at and meet your body where it's at. All right. So let's try second side, breathing into your back and side. Breathe out abs. So I'm going to explain the tips while you continue to do this for each pelvic tilt type. So for APT, take extra care to tuck your bottom under. You're going to want to tend to arch your pelvis and back while you're doing this. If you're in a posterior tilt, be sure that you're not overly clenching your glutes. It's okay to squeeze them, particularly the top and side glute. We don't want to be squeezing the glutes together. Okay. When we're doing that, we're getting more of what we call the deep hip rotator muscles, which are not helpful muscles for getting stronger for this position. And they can tend to irritate things in our pelvis. And then if you're on a high hinge point or really work on filling in that gap where your hinge is to do that, you're going to feel like you're really flexing your abs. It's going to take a lot of work just to hold it, let alone to breathe. But I'm going to challenge you and I want you to try that because that's going to be really helpful for you. 
And if you're one of those people that has trouble with holding handstands or getting a straight line in your back layout, this is going to be the best thing you could ever do for that, along with the power production and the injury prevention that you're going to gain from this. Awesome. All right. So that's great. You guys can stop. If you noticed one side was a lot harder to do when you do your conditioning, I would do that side twice because we want it to catch up. Side planks are the number one thing that I see have a difference one side to the other. Some people could do, you know, three minutes on one side and 30 seconds on the other. And obviously that's not healthy for our body's balance. So take some time to do a little bit extra on the side that you need. <clears throat> okay, cool. So that was the last thing we're going to work on together. And my last uh, area that I wanted to bring up, does anybody have any questions about uh, anything we've talked about tonight, you can type it into chat if you would prefer, or you can speak, but I'm here to answer anything you guys might need to know. Ah, looks like there's something in chat. Let me see what that says. My hamstring cramped on the 9090. Yes, that happens a lot. So the 9090 to refresh your memory is the one with the feet against the wall. If you're, one of your hamstrings cramps, that generally means that you're putting more weight into that side. Not always, but that's usually what it is. So my first suggestion would be to tell the other hamstring to do a little bit more. Even if it feels like that other hamstring is doing its equal amount, just try it. Because most of the time we have a favorite leg that we like to work on, and that is why it cramps. Um, the other thing you can consider is you can consider your magnesium intake, your potassium intake. If you're trying that tip and it doesn't really help it, uh, your electrolytes are those two as well as your uh, salt. So those things can come into play as well as fluid intake. Um, so those are just like overall tips. I am a certified nutritionist as well. So I like to make sure I give people the full comprehensive, you know, solutions to stuff. But anyone else have any questions? The side plank hurt your shoulder. Yes. So that is something that I do here at times as well. So there's a few things you can try with that. Um, let me actually get my chair here. So one thing we can try is going up on the hand and seeing if that feels better. Okay. And obviously it's now making me at a higher angle. So I might need to do this on the floor or on the lower chair. Um, you can do it on a staircase and find the perfect height for yourself. That's one thing you can try. The other thing you can try is making sure that your elbow is actually under your chest. So we don't want it like kind of a, like a 10 out to the side. And I'm not even gonna show that to you in a side plank because it hurts me just thinking about it. <laughs> but if you have someone's arm like way out, it'll feel easier because you're, it's like building a tent, like you, it's, a, you know, the tent's like that, it's not this way. Um, so it kind of gives you that leverage, but at a price and at the price of your muscles doing the work. And instead your bones and your ligaments and your tendons are holding you up, which obviously isn't like what we would want. So check that elbow position. You also can think about, tucking your scapula under a little bit. So my scapula back here, I can kind of have my arm like that. And that's what we call winging out of it. Or I can pull my tip of my scapula down and that's going to tuck me under like that. And that can be another nice way to set because um, if we have shoulders that are having trouble holding us up, a lot of times it's just the way we're setting it up. Sometimes it is actually weakness. I don't see this a lot in gymnasts, but just in case, I am going to show you guys an accessory movement that you can try. These are called serratus presses. And over there. Okay, so you'll lie on your side for this. Always good to have head support. That. Here you can see me. Yep, oh, that's cool. Um, so my knees are bent. I'm forming my mini side plank by pushing into the ground with my bottom side hip. You're going to have a weight. A light weight's good to start. Between a two and a five is usually plenty. You'll see my palm is facing forward. I'm going to slightly rotate it so that my thumb is up toward my head a bit. And then keeping my arm really vertical, I'm going to stretch and extend. And I'm going to let my scapula slide down my back. Stretch and extend. Scapula slide down my back. Stretch and extend. Scapula slide down. Don't let your shoulder ride up by your ear like I just did. <laughs> Telling you, it's like no matter how much you know, you still have mess up reps sometimes. Stretch and down. And it's important to not let the front of your shoulder kind of pop forward. So keeping everything really stacked, taking the time to do that is really important. And make sure that elbow stays straight because sometimes people will 
kind of go like that and they feel like they're moving the weight but they're not sliding in the shoulder like we would want all right so that is a good one to do if um if you feel like you're literally just really weak in this and that's why it's hurting because obviously if you're asking yourself to hold your body up which could weigh whatever it weighs i mean it's going to weigh more than a weight would usually like a little hand weight so you're asking your shoulder to hold up a, a relatively heavy body so it makes sense that a little bit of extra work might be needed but because uh when you're on your elbow it's what we call closed chain, meaning that we can't really move our elbow because it's on the ground. So people can usually do heavier loads when they're like that than when they do an open chain where they have their hand just like wavering around in space, less stable that way. That's the same reason why it's harder to do a handstand on the rings than it is to do a handstand on the floor. Uh, so it is, you know, normal for the weight to be less than your body, but at the same time, we want to have the strength to use a reasonable size dumbbell and be able to do an exercise like that. So are there any other questions about this topic? All right, it looks like everyone's all good. That's great. And so I did want to uh, just kind of summarize everything by mentioning that taking the time to normalize your pelvic tilt will be a very, very valuable use of your time, not only as a gymnast, but just as a human person who wants to feel good and function well into older ages. So definitely take the time to work on it. It's going to really pay off. And the neutral pelvic position just really makes for more powerful muscles. And it's going to be amazing for your sport as well as for everything else too. So like I said before, my name is Gina Paulus. I am a pregnancy and postpartum corrective exercise specialist. I do also work with people who have back pains, hamstring issues, shoulder troubles, like any of that stuff I'm able to help out with, with my corrective exercise sessions. I do offer one-on-one -on -one meetings and, um, I offer separate programs for gymnasts. I offer programs for lay people and all of that stuff. I do have a PDF that's affiliated with this call that you can get all the links from nice and conveniently, um, but you can also just pop onto adult-gymnastics.com and into the search bar, you can type diastasis. And if you do that, you're gonna see all the calls I've done for free where you can watch them just like the ones we did today. You will also see links where you can sign up for my programs. I do have free 15 minute discovery calls available. If you just want to talk to me and kind of figure out like what's going on with you, what do I think you need? If Is it me helping you? Is it that someone else needs to help? Like whatever it is, I'm there to just help. That's really why I'm here. So I'm more than happy to speak with you on one of those if you want to schedule one of those. Um, I will announce my next call on the Facebook group, just like Fine Wine Adult Gymnastics. We've done five calls on diastasis, and now I'm ready to do five calls on pelvic floor. I know a lot of people have trouble with pelvic floor, and it's an area that's really important to focus on. It's part of our core. So you can watch for that announcement. Um, I also have a newsletter where I will send out announcements. I have an Instagram at Adult Gymnastics Camp, and I have Twitter at Adult Gymnastics so that you guys can see all that stuff and kind of get the updates. If you do want to be added to my newsletter list, feel free to pop it into chat and I'll make sure to check that at the end. And other than that, I hope everyone has a great night and I really appreciate you taking the time to be on this call with me. I know it's busy this time of year, but awesome for you for uh, taking the time. I'm sure your body will thank you for it. Good night.